sessions where you were covering unit reviews. Emily was trying to cover like 700 years of history in five seconds. Um, yeah. And it was, a, it was a wild ride. But what I wanna do is show you two things real quick that are gonna help you. The first is check out our study guide pack. We pin this to the chat. This study guide pack is kind of, we're famous for this now, Emily, right? Because it yes. just breaks down the entire course into two page cheat sheets for there's unit one, here's unit two and all the way through. So if you're thinking like, oh, there's too much stuff for me to memorize. I, I can't keep this from straight from that. Uh, my textbook's 900 pages. My, my test prep book is too long. This is something that gets it all down in two page guides. The other thing I wanna tell you about is the playlist we have on our channel where um, we actually have a really fun video series where Emily writes a DBQ in slow motion on camera and I score it. So if you're on the West Coast and it's only 6.30 something, you have some time to do that. But tonight's session is all about test prep tips that are gonna help you. Emily, I'm gonna turn it over to you. If we do get enough likes on this video, Emily, we will bring in Marco. He of Marco, I'm John. Marco is, uh, that he's looking at me right now. Um, Please. Fluffy and white and heavy and furry and not macro. He will be coming live at the end. I'm going to um, get him set up. But Emily, I'm going to turn it over to you to, okay. to give us test prep tips. Okay, awesome. And I'm going to be looking right here, but I want to really awkwardly for a second acknowledge TikTok. Hey, if you're joining me on my TikTok, you should come over to YouTube to the Marco Learning Channel and you'll be able to see the whole thing. But you can also stick around here. I'll just be looking the other direction. Okay. Um, so first of all, thanks everyone for coming. Hopefully this chat will be like a lot more chill than the other chat. It's getting a lot of anxiety. Um, what I, all I wanted to go over, we're not going to keep you very late. Um, because honestly, especially if you're on the East coast, one of the best things you can do pretty soon is start to try to wind yourself down and go to sleep. But I wanted to do is walk through basically the three sections of the exam and just make sure you understand the key strategies. I'm going to tell you right now, if you are here because you want me to explain how to hip all the documents, I'm not going to do that tonight because frankly, this might sound mean, but if you don't already know how to do it, then don't worry about it on the test tomorrow, right? This is about strategery. This is about like knowing how to maximize the points you can get tomorrow with what you already know. Okay. And so with that, you're going to walk into your exam, whether you're taking the digital exam or the paper exam. And the first section you're going to get is the multiple choice. That's going to be the only section you can work on. And so you will get 55 multiple choice questions in 55 minutes. If you're on the digital exam, and John, correct me if this is wrong, my understanding is you'll be able to go back and forth. So you can kind of mark questions and say, I need to come back and look at that more later. Um, whether you're on the paper or the digital, you can kind of work throughout the 55 multiple choice questions, however you want, right? Yeah. Here, oh, is that right? To, just to interject real quick for all of yeah. you taking digital exams and let us know in the chat whether you are. Remember this year's digital exams will let you flag questions as you go, move back and forth, maintain your notes in a document. So you have one document, three questions. You can highlight and annotate that document on a DBQ or on multiple choice and reference it the entire time. The other thing to remember is there's a process of elimination tool. So if you've not yet practiced on Blue Book inside of the portal, you can do that tonight for 30 minutes. It'll help calm your nerves. Mm -hmm. um, and help you see like, actually, this is kind of cool because I can annotate, save my notes, save questions, go back and review all my flag questions and process of eliminate. That's me plugging a technology that hasn't done that well this week, but that's a quick update on the digital um, AP exams. As those questions come back up, I'll, I'll pop back in. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. In theory, if it works the way it's supposed to knock on wood, you'll be able to go back and forth. You'll be able to flag questions say I need to come back. Here is the most important strategy for multiple choice, whether you're taking the paper or the digital exam. And I'm going to explain this, but the strategy is quantity over quality, meaning you need to make sure you get through all 55 questions and have a guess for all 55. It is better for you to maybe feel like you're going a little fast. Like let's say one, two, three, four, you feel pretty good about. Let's say you get to question five and you go, man, I really think I can figure this out. And you're sitting there for two, three, four, five minutes trying to figure it out. I believe in you. I believe that you can figure it out. You just probably shouldn't right now. That is a moment where after two or three minutes, you should flag it. 
If you have a guess, make a guess, but flag it and keep going. Because remember, the questions don't get easier or harder. They're scattered all throughout and every question is essentially equal. So if you think about it like Super Mario Brothers or something, these are all gold coins. And like literally some are low, some are really high. They're all gold coins. And so go through and grab up the easy ones, the ones that are a little bit more straightforward for you. Get through all 55 and make sure that you've grabbed the easy questions easy, right? Then go back and make kind of your best guesses or sit and try to like figure out the ones you really need to figure out, right? The point is just that um, you can't on any of this test, you can't get points taken away from you. And so one of the worst things you can do is just leave questions on the table and not even get to them or answer them, right? So be comfortable tomorrow with cutting ties with a question. If you're sitting there and you're like, gosh, my brain is not working. And I'm like a few minutes into this question already, don't panic. Be comfortable saying, I'm going to come back to this later if I have time, but I'm going to trust that there's two or three questions down the road that I'll have an easier time with. And those two or three are going to be worth more than this one I'm struggling over. Remember that what you're shooting for tomorrow on the test is at, or like, let's say around 70%. You're shooting maybe to get honestly between 60 and 80% on any of the sections, which means on the multiple choice, you can still miss like 15 questions out of 55 and be in line to pass the test, assuming you do pretty well on the other sections. So you are not gonna get every question right tomorrow. And that's okay. Even when I take practice exams, I don't always get all the multiple choice right. So if you get to one that's really hard, don't freak out and get stuck on it, mark it, keep on trucking, right? Okay. With that in mind, um, I'm going to give you, I want to trademark this. I don't know how to trademark things, but I want to trademark this. I'm just going to say it out loud, like Michael Scott declaring bankruptcy, um, that if you are desperate, let's say you're like, man, I've eliminated one obvious wrong answer. I've eliminated another I think is wrong. I'm down to two. I have literally no idea. Okay. If you're in that situation, step one, Figure out which one makes more sense with the document they gave you. The document they give you with the multiple choice, it's sometimes really helpful, sometimes not very helpful, but it's never random. So if you're down to two questions or two answers and you're like, I just need to make a guess and move on. Well, let's say one of the answers is about gender and one of the answers is about the economy. Go look at the document. Is it a diary from a woman about her experience in the war of whatever? Great. Then pick the one on gender. Like this is if you're sort of desperate, just think about which one thematically, think about almost like your spice tea themes matches the document more. Great. Now, if you're totally desperate and you're like, they both match the document. I don't know the themes. Then literally pick the vaguest answer. That's my trademark. Pick the answer choice that's left that's the most vague. And what I mean by that is like, it's the difference between having an answer choice that's like um, all trade through China was luxury goods bound for the Silk Road. That's a very specific statement versus cultures spread along trade routes. You see what I mean? So if you're down to those two and you're like, well, they both, I don't know, maybe they're both right. And you're just not sure. Pick the one that's more broad, that's more vague, that sounds more like the like big ideas that me and Heimler just went through. Basically, it doesn't mean that a specific answer is automatically wrong, but that's like if you're desperate and need to move on. Okay, so with that, quantity over quality for the multiple choice. Make sure you get through all of them, even if that means you have to go kind of fast through some that if you had more time, you'd be able to figure out. Okay. Then you are going to turn in your multiple choice section. And I always, I want to be really clear about this because I have a lot of students that use this strategy. They're like, great for evidence for the SAQ. I'll just go back and reference the documents in the multiple choice. That's so smart. You're thinking so smart, but you're not gonna be able to do that tomorrow. You are going to like turn in or on the digital exam, like move on from the multiple choice and you won't be able to go back. So with that, you will then get the short answer questions. There are three short answer questions. I always like to draw a diagram because they've made this so confusing, right? There's basically question one where you're going to answer A, B, and C, all of them. Then you're going to have a sheet of paper for question two where you're going to answer A, B, and C, all three. And then you'll get SAQ number three or four where you'll get a choice. So it's three SAQs or kind of like nine like little mini questions. Treat this the same as the multiple choice. Make sure that you get through and have a chance to answer all of these, 
even if that means you kind of have to cut ties with one or two where you're like, oh, I could write a whole essay on this. Don't. Don't write a whole essay on 1A. Answer it as much as you need to, to be like, I've answered the question with one specific piece of evidence and I've explained it in a way that the grader knows that I know what I'm talking about and then move on. What I always tell my students to do if you're doing it on the paper is when you get the three papers, you can literally just divide it up and go A, B, C, right? A, B, C. And that way it's like the multiple choice. You can keep track of which ones you maybe you need to skip. So let's say you get to one A and you panic. I see some of you in the chat that are like, uh, I don't know anything from world history. First, that's not true. That's your anxiety talking. You know literally something that has happened in the last 800 years. Okay. But two, let's say you get to an SAQ and you're like, no, but really, I can't think of a single thing. Skip it. Go to B. Try to answer B. Go to C. Get through. Again, it's like grabbing up the points. All of these little parts of the SAQ are each worth one point. They're each one like Super Mario coin. And so if there's one that you don't know, but there's two more later that you know, go grab those. Again, you're not shooting for getting nine out of nine. You don't need to get every single one. You want to get, if you can get six or seven of these right, that's great. But again, you want to have a guess for all of them. You don't want to leave anything blank. Just throw something out there, right? Explain the document, do something, right? But again, it's same as the multiple choice. It's quantity over quality, meaning it is so much better for you to write like a fine answer and get for all of them than to write like a banging, incredible answer for A, B, and C and then run out of time and not even get to try the last one, right? You don't get bonus points. There's no complexity on the SAQ. The biggest issue my students have when they leave the SAQ is time. They're just like, oh, I wrote a really good SAQ for the first one and I had so much evidence and then I ran out of time. So again, know that you can go back and forth between the SAQs. So you can put down like a bare bones answer and get through all of them that you can and then go back and keep adding until time is up. Again, they can't take points away from you. So let's say that you write one piece of evidence and then you come back later to beef it up and you add something else that's just terrible and awful. They're not gonna take points away from you. They're just gonna lovingly be like, nope, we're not gonna consider that, right? So literally for the SAQ, it's two to four sentences. If you're writing more than four sentences, you've either already answered it and you don't need to write anymore or you are rambling and off on a tangent, right? So that's kind of the sweet spot. Okay, with that, you will then submit or turn in your SAQ and that's the moment where you'll get a break. I can never remember if it's 10 or 15 minutes, but it's that really awkward time where you're like silently eating your snack with all your classmates and you're not allowed to talk about the exam and you're just sitting there waiting for the DBQ, right? And so then you're gonna come in to do the writing portion. Um, I'm seeing a few questions that I just want to make sure are really clear. No, you do not need a thesis statement for the SAQ. I will say this again. The SAQs are not essays. They're not even body paragraphs. It is like caveman speak, get your ideas out there. Um, for example, one SAQ from a few years back, which it's a pretty dark example, but it's the one that always comes to mind, is like there was an SAQ a few years back where one of the questions was, it was a document about mass violence committed by states in the 20th century, right? So states who were then like murdering or killing or imprisoning a bunch of people. And one of the questions just said, identify one example of mass violence committed by a totalitarian state in the 20th century. And all you had to write for the answer was, one example was the Holocaust, which occurred in Nazi Germany and led to the death of 6 million Jews plus 6 million others. Like what you, all you needed to do was name the event and explain it enough that the grader knew you knew what you were talking about. In one sentence, you've answered the question. You do not need to write an essay. You don't even need to write a whole body paragraph. Now, of course, if they say explain, maybe add one another sentence, just like maybe explaining why they did that or why that state did it. But the point is that you don't need a thesis. You don't need a hook. This is not going to be good writing. It just has to be complete sentences. Okay. Cool. So yes, then you turn in the SAQ. That part of the exam is done. You get a break. You come in for basically the second part of the exam. And this is where you're going to get the writing packet that's going to have your DBQ and your LEQ options. So I want to be really clear. This is the only part of the exam where in theory you can go back and forth. This is the only part of the exam where you could like 
switch the order and go, I'm going to write the LEQ first and then come back and do the DBQ. I don't do that, but you could in theory. So this section gives you a little more freedom. There's a lot more strategery involved. And I will just give you the basics of that. And then like John said, literally, if you're still feeling really stressed about the DBQ, you can go on this channel or go on my channel, Anti-Social Studies, and just Google or search Emily writes a DBQ. I've written like one on this channel, two on mine. Like you can literally watch me write one live and see how I work through everything and kind of see my strategy. I'm not going to go through all of that right now. I just want to make sure that we're really clear. The strategy for the second part of the exam flips. The first part was quantity over quality. Have an answer for everything. Attempt every point. Don't skip a multiple choice. Don't skip an SAQ. It flips in part two to quality over quantity. You do not need to attempt all seven points on the DBQ to do well. In fact, I actually think it's a trap. It's really hard to get a seven out of seven in an hour. I sometimes do it and sometimes don't. It is actually way more in your best interest on these big long essays to shoot for like five points out of the seven or five points out of the six, basically ignore complexity. You might magically do it. Complexity just sort of happens. It's something you can't force. So there's no point trying to force it in there anyway, right? And so it's way better for you to shoot for maybe five points, five or six points on the DBQ, five points on the LEQ and do those really well. So you are all overthinking these essays. First of all, DBQ and LEQ are the same they're the same. You're going to write the same essay. The only difference is that on the DBQ essay, your evidence is going to come from the documents. And on the LEQ essay, the evidence is going to come from your brain. That's it. Literally, this could be three paragraphs, maybe three really long paragraphs. You are going to have an introduction that at its core could literally just be your thesis statement. Your introduction could literally just be your one or two sentence thesis statement, and that's it. You just answer the question, th this is my answer because, and you give your reasoning. In an ideal world, you would contextualize the prompt. So you would look at the prompt and go, oh, what's a piece of information, either going a little bit back in time or thinking about like what else is happening in another part of the world that's going to help us kind of get into this headspace. That's where you can be a little bit creative, almost like with a hook. Pro tip, if the uh, essays about imperialism, you can use industrialization for context. If the essay is about industrialization, you can use imperialism for context, right? If the essay is about the Cold War, you can use World War II for context, right? I mean, it's not rocket science, right? You're literally just being like, here's the thing that happened before that got us where we are. And then you have a thesis. And guess what? In one paragraph, you get two points. When I tell you that the like global average for the DBQ is a two at most, we can all take a deep breath, take a deep breath, right? So without understanding any of the documents, without knowing any additional information, you can get a two tomorrow. If you, on both the LEQ and the DBQ, if you just write, contextualize the prompt and have a simple thesis, I don't even need to go into the chat to know that y'all are asking me right now about probably like a counter argument, I'm so sorry, you're gonna be mad at your teacher. You don't need a counter argument on the AP exam. To get the thesis point, you don't have to give a counter argument. Now, it's great. Like it's so much better to have a counter argument. That's complexity, it's really good. Your teacher's doing a good job by encouraging you to do that. But tomorrow, if you are panicking going, I can't think of a counter argument, I can just think of a really simple argument, then do the simple argument. Tomorrow is about, survival. Tomorrow is not about putting your best foot forward as far as writing. The essays you write tomorrow, no one's going to see them besides you and your grader. The college board is like your colleges aren't going to see them. It is about just showing what you know, even if it's very simplistic. So again, for both essays, you're going to have an intro, context thesis. Then you're going to move down into body paragraphs. And listen up, y'all, a body paragraph is just a really long SAQ. That's all it is. A body paragraph is just an SAQ with maybe like two pieces of evidence instead of one. That's it. Don't overthink it, right? A body paragraph is just like a topic sentence. And then this document proves it because blah, blah, blah. This document proves it because blah, blah, blah. 
or you pull in your own evidence, right? And again, it's quality over quantity as far as evidence goes. So on the LEQ, it is, it is not helpful to just list every single thing, every term you heard Heimler say tonight. Like that's not helpful. It's way better to pick a few examples that you're like, I really understand this one. So let's say that the essay, DVQ or LEQ is about the impact of the Cold War on decolonization. And you're gonna make an argument that um, the Cold War led to instability in new post-colonial governments. And that's your topic sentence. Great. For example, the Congo. And then you spend two, three sentences talking about the Congo, which if you were on the YouTube before, you now know is the inspiration for Wakanda. And you'll be like, for example, right? Like a nation rich in uranium, the US and the Soviet Union both really wanted it, blah, 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 right? That as one piece of evidence is so much better than listing like five African countries and being like, for example, these five countries all struggled. That's not helpful. It's more important quality that you can explain it really well, right? Okay, now, and just to be clear, that's it. That's literally the whole essay, intro, body paragraph with evidence or documents, body paragraph with evidence or documents, as many as you need to get through what you need to get through. That's it. Now on the DBQ, there's a little more worry about like, well, what if I just don't understand the documents? So I just want to remind you of one other fact. Remember, if we can do context and thesis, we already have a two, which is fine. I mean, it's not, a two is not going to get you like a five on the exam, but it's okay, right? Okay, you get another point for literally just addressing three documents. And by that, I mean summarizing three documents in your own words. That's it. So let's say tomorrow you are panicking and you're like looking at a blank sheet of paper going, I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail. I don't understand what any of these documents, I don't understand. Take a deep breath, leave some space for your intro and just start by picking out three documents that you kind of understand. And then just saying, document one is, and then just put it into your own words, right? Document one is a cartoon of Cecil Rhodes striding across Africa. This represents British imperialism and the British wanting to take control of the continent for diamonds and other things. Document one. Document three shows that. Like literally just get your brain going. That's a way to help with that sort of writer's block. If you're panicking and you're like, I don't even know how to make this into an argument. I don't know what groups I'm going to do. Guess what? You also don't need to group the documents. Again, it's better to. If you can, you should. But if you're like, shoot, I don't know how to group any of these documents together. Guess what? You could have seven body paragraphs, one for each document on its own. Fine, right? Tomorrow, again, is about strategy and just like, let me get my words on the page if it's not super well organized, that is okay. They don't take off for spelling. They don't take off for grammar. They don't take off for organization. If you have to draw a crazy line that's like, read this sentence up here, no problem. And I've been a grader. I'm, I, I'm telling you, they don't care. Now, if you can make it as easy as possible for them, that's great. But if that is the thing that's holding you back, where you're like, oh my gosh, I can't think of a group. And so you just, for the documents, and you just sit there and stare at a piece of paper, you don't need to. Just start talking about each document on its own. Again, if you can just address three documents, you get another point. Again, we're seeing like you don't need to do everything perfectly tomorrow to do well on this test, right? Think about it. You have context of thesis, you address three documents, right? And then you bring in one piece of evidence on your own that you happen to know. And guess what? You're at a four. That's really good. If my students walked out with a four on the DBQ, I'd be really excited. So, again, just to be clear, you get one point for, um, Context thesis, you get one point for addressing three documents. You get another point if you actually use six documents. So again, if you understand six documents, then you 100% should use them, right? Then you get another point for bringing in your own piece of evidence. The last two points that to me are the least worth it tomorrow are evaluating like the source of the document, which is I call HIP and complexity. Right. So keep in mind that like shooting for a solid five tomorrow. And if it eases your stress to go, you know what, I'm going to pretend complexity doesn't exist. And I'm going to just forget about hipping the documents. That's like point of view intended audience. And I'm just going to make sure I have like good intro, 
I use six, all six, I use six or all seven documents and I bring in my own evidence. That's a really solid five. And again, the global average is like a two. So again, this is what I mean. The first half of the exam is like quantity over quality. Get through the whole thing. Even after you have, even if you, if you have to like go fast through some of them, get through every question, have a guess or an answer for every question and the multiple choice and the short answer. Then on the writing, take a deep breath. I promise you have time. It's more time than you think. Take a deep breath and go for quality. Be like, okay, what point do I feel like I can do really well right now? I can do context right now. I'll start with that. You can like Frankenstein your essay together to where if the first thing to do is just like explain your documents and you want to do that first and then come back and write your thesis in the, at the end, that's fine. Right. Again, this is basically your first draft. I'm seeing a lot of people being like, I'm so nervous. This is my first AP exam. Keep in mind that all the writing, especially the essays that you turn in tomorrow, are going to be rough drafts. It's going to make you feel weird because you're going to be like, I want to edit this and I want to make it better. I want to organize it better. You're just not. You're going to turn in your rough draft and it might be crazy and all over the place. And we, the graders, are going to figure it out and award you as many points as we can. So, again, when I say quality over quantity, I don't mean that you should be like, oh, cool, I feel good, I have a five, I have 20 minutes left, but I'm going to doodle instead. Oh my God, no. You should write until the time is up, right? But so what I mean is like, and you'll see if you go watch me write DBQs, you'll see that like, I only think about HIP if I've done everything else and I'm like, okay, I have a little bit of time, I'll go back and try to analyze some of these documents, right? So that's, you can Frankenstein and kind of keep adding points in, right? And at that point, you maybe feel a little more confident because you have a lot of stuff down. You're like, oh, I have a pretty solid essay now. Now my brain can maybe think higher up about like bias and stuff, right? Last thing on this, and then um, I would love, maybe John can pop back on in a second and tell me if there were like any big crazy questions in the chat that we need to address. Last big thing about timing is that the timing, you should try on the second half, that's the DBQ and the LEQ, you should try to follow the timing suggestions as closely as possible. So what should happen is your test proctor tomorrow should be like, we recommend you start with a DBQ. We recommend you start with a 15 minute reading period, meaning like, that's your time to go through and look at the documents and figure it out. Keep in mind, if you've gone through the documents and you're ready to write and that reading period isn't up, you just start writing. That time in there is all flexible. You start writing whenever you want to, right? Then at the end of an hour, they'll say something like, the, we recommend you move on to the LEQ for the last 40 minutes. But if you're right in the middle of a thought for your DBQ, keep going. The DBQ is more important by a long shot than the LEQ. So it is okay to steal a little bit of time for the LEQ to finish your thought and what you're doing on the DBQ. Now, if you're kind of done, you might be like, shoot, this is literally all I can write about these documents. Great, then move on. But if you're like, no, you're still going and you're in the zone, then just know to be like, okay, I got to finish up. But it's totally fine to use more than the hour for the DBQ. As long as you make sure you leave yourself like 25, 30 minutes for the LEQ. Because remember, the LEQ is the easiest part of the exam. I promise you it's the easiest part of the exam. One, it's worth the least on the, your overall score. And two, you're going to get three prompts from three different eras. And you essentially just need to be able to write like three paragraphs about it. I guarantee you there is going to be one of those three prompts that you're like, I can make a basic argument about this and just make like two simple arguments with evidence. I promise you'll be okay. All right. With that, John, I'd love to know, did you see any big questions in the chat? I'm going to kind of scroll through and see if there's big yeah. questions asking. Hey, everyone. John from Marco Learning. I've been um, hanging around in the chat. It's, it's a calm. It's smooth sailing here in this chat. Yeah. I don't it's know so what's happening on your TikTok at Antisocial Studies. Yeah. Um, one thing that came up, somebody was asking about, people have been asking about the mechanics of the test with paper and pencil and notes. Mm -hmm. Remember, everyone, if you're taking the paper exam, you're going to do your multiple choice in pencil. Scribble, scrabble, erase, cross out. You're going to take a 10 minute break, cry, run to the bathroom, stick your head in the sink, cry, not cheat and talk to people and take out your cell phone and ruin everything. Then you're gonna like settle down, 
get in your seat and you're going to write in pen for the free response questions, the SAQ, short answer questions, the DBQ, the document based question, and the LEQ, the long essay question. Yeah. Someone was asking, and then while you're there, you can scribble scrabble all over your booklet, write. Sometimes thinking through your hands is a really useful way to deal with the like mental health problems that you're facing in the middle of the test. Another thing, everyone, is there's kind of like this is such a basic thing and it's a bit of a hack for the exam. Um, and uh, what I'm looking at here is the 2022 AP World History exam. When you actually look at this, Emily on our channel did a walkthrough of this very once. If you just want to look at last year's questions, college boards put it out. We did a, a quick kind of overview of what you needed to do. But look at this, everyone, right at the front of the DBQ. Wait, what do I do? What is what is the rubric? It's here. The rubric is here. A point for thesis, a point for contextualization. Use at least six documents. We recommend try seven. Get some outside info in there. Talk about HIP. Emily, there were some questions about HIP. Yeah. HIP, oh, happy. What is HIP in a nutshell? Yeah, there's a lot of questions about HIP or whatever. And again, it's probably the point that's the least worth the effort. So if you're like, I don't know, then just focus on the other points. But essentially what it means is after you use a document as evidence, you then, honestly, the sentence stem that helps me the most is go, we should consider that. So let's say you've talked about a document and you've applied it to your argument. And then you go, we should consider the point of view of this document. We should consider, so HIP stands for like historical situation, intended audience, purpose, point of view. You don't actually have to pick one and stick with it. You can just, it. what it just means is the college board wants to see if you can read between the lines and understand that this document is not pure. It's not pure history and just like pure fact that you can grab facts from it, but you can also be like, you know, we should consider that this is a political speech and this guy was running for president. So maybe he's gonna really exaggerate the things he's done well. You're not saying this whole document is garbage and we shouldn't trust it, but you're just showing the college board grader that you're like, I get it that this whatever document is not pure fact. And that like, I can give you a little bit of analysis on why it might be a little bit tainted or biased or whatever, essentially. And Emily, what I loved about your insight there, you've been a reader, you know how this game is played. This is one of those really cost inefficient things to do. Yeah. This is the amateur hour move of test takers. I've been helping test takers for a long time. Yeah. Let's just put this in context, everyone. This little outside piece of information, sorry, let me clear my screen. Um, this outside piece of information here, this little nugget. One piece of information. One little chicken McNugget of AP world history content that is not in one of the seven documents. One, to, you can earn this with one or two sentences, right? Yeah. There's a, you buy a 20 pack of chicken McNuggets. You put one of them down in paragraph two. You force somebody like Emily for one or two sentences of effort to give you a point. You're not sure whether you did it right. Maybe smuggle one or two more in. It kind of sounds great. That's an easy way to earn one point. This is a whole, this is, th this is a whole pack of chicken. Like three documents, right? For one point. Yeah. So again, it's not that you shouldn't attempt HIP. I want to be really clear. Some of you yes. out there should, and some of you out there probably maybe HIP or sourcing or whatever you call it comes easily to you. All I'm saying is don't force it. So if you in your class, your teacher, I do the same thing. Your teacher probably walked you through activities where you were like, Hey, for every document, apply it to the prompt and think about a possible HIP. You don't need to force it. What I do, if you watch me write the, the essays is I just make a note. If I'm reading a document and I was like, oh, this is hella biased. Then I just make a note to myself. Hey, if I have time, I should come back and discuss this thing. But for now, I'm just going to get the basic information from it and apply it to my argument. Then if I'm done and I look up and have 10 minutes, I'm going to go back and see, hey, maybe I can evaluate the source of three different documents. And again, you can just do those in another paragraph. It doesn't have to be perfectly organized. You can literally just be like, back to document two that we were talking about a few paragraphs ago, right? It's not gonna be pretty. But yeah, that's probably the, it takes you the most work to get one point for that sourcing. So that's why don't stress about it. If it's not coming to you, if you're looking at a document and you're like, I got nothing for HIP, it is honestly better to not worry about it and just focus on beefing up the rest of your argument. I love this. And really what we're getting at here, guys, is that 
is strategic choices you're going to make tomorrow. Because what happens is people get panic brain, right? When Emily, you and I have, well, we're smart people. Our brains go, y'all are smart people. You're here. We love you. Um, you're overthinking. Like, why, what do you hear? It's past your bedtime. Go to bed, everyone. Leave. Um, and so you're overthinking everything. You're going to get in the test tomorrow. You're going to overthink. And then in the moment of overthinking, you will make a bad choice, but not right now because we're helping you make better choices and go after an easy point. Go after that thesis, lay it out. It's easy. Contextualization, two to three sentences, a little bit harder. But if you start out early with it, go for it. As yeah. you're working through the documents, here's, here's another thing, Emily, that's really important. As you work through documents, here's what you're not allowed to say tomorrow, everyone. I don't understand every word of this document. Help. It was so hard. I can't understand it. I, I literally couldn't read this. I literally couldn't understand anything. I don't look. Who is this? Yeah. Like, who's this? I don't yeah. know. I didn't, my teacher didn't teach me this. My teacher betrayed me. Yes. This is one thing that is also great Gen Z impression, by the way. Yes. So Thank good. Um, I thought you were 16, but I am. Uh, one for, thing I'm to real for that. understand is that y'all, the whole point of the DBQ is that it is supposed to be a question that you don't know the answer to at first. That's literally the whole point. A few years ago, people were furious at me at Heimler because in our big Heimler review, people were like, what about the Mexican revolution or the Russian revolution? And we all just said, don't worry about it. Just know one of them. Just pick one of them to know. Pick the Russian revolution, whatever. And then guess what? The DBQ was on the Mexican revolution and they were furious in my comment section. But I kept having to remind them, no, no, the whole point is that the DBQ is supposed to be asking you about something that at first glance, you don't know the answer because what they're testing you on is can you figure out the answer by going through these documents? And like what John just said, you do not need to understand every word of every document. You just need to, you're hunting for evidence. That's all you're doing. So you just need to understand enough to pick out one or two points from the document that then you can apply to your argument, right? So even if there's parts of it you don't understand, read the source information word for word. A lot of times they give you 80% of the information you need and the little source information, and then just skim the document for evidence you can use for your argument, right? This is not you having to sit back and understand every word of it. So again, like don't stress tomorrow. You, you will probably open the page to the DBQ and at first go, oh my God, I don't understand this at all. And just remember that's the point. And what they're testing you on is like, but can you figure it out? And I promise you the DBQ will be asking about stuff that you actually do know. You actually understand. You just maybe don't know how it applies to this exact situation. Yeah. I also, one okay. other good question really quickly about a curve, which is more over on my TikTok. Yes, of course there's a curve on the AP exam. Of course there is. Now it's not math. It's like a very mystical, magical science that we can't quite figure out. But essentially when I, I've looked at statistics for the last AP world exams, people who are getting a five are, are on average getting around 80% of the possible points across the exam. So you can do that math, but like what it means is maybe they're doing a little better on some, whatever, but they're essentially getting around 80% of the multiple choice questions, right? 80% of the SAQs, whatever. If you're shooting for a four, most of those students are getting like a 75-ish percent or something. And then a three is maybe more like a 65%. So again, just keep that in mind that no one needs to get a perfect score. None of you are going to get a perfect score tomorrow. And that is perfectly fine. Um, just, and that's why like they mostly just want, our goal for you tonight with this live is just that you don't panic, that you take a deep breath yeah. because you don't need to know everything. You don't need to get every question right. You just need to like, it's a marathon. You need to make it through the test and give yourself kind of the best chance. In fact, Emily, on that note, I want to really center on this for just a second because a lot of people will have as an idea, they almost like when you see something like this, you think you're doing reading comprehension. Mm -hmm. And let me pull this back up on the screen. You think you're doing reading comprehension. You're not. You will be asked zero specific questions about whatever this person is saying. You will be asked zero questions about what an individual word means inside of one of these passages. In fact, you won't be asked individually about any of these passages. You can flat out just walk away from a, from a document completely as part of your strategy if it's, if it's overwhelming you. So yeah. not only are you not doing reading comprehension, and do you not have to be perfect? And you need, as you said, like an 80, so a nice B, a nice cool C plus, 
we'll get you in five territory. Yeah. Um, that's a, just a totally different approach from the way we think of school exams and having to know things and, and that accountability. And that's why in the chat, everyone is going to write right now, I will not be perfect. Write that in all capital letters. I will not be perfect. Um, and I want to see like 978 of those in this chat, Emily, just so we all like talk ourselves off of this ledge of yeah. kind of being up here and coming down. But you were going to say something. Oh, I was going to say, feel free to misspell it too, if you, yeah. I will not be perfect and feel free to misspell it. If you I'm not using Grammarly tomorrow is another thing you can write because you're not going to be perfect. You're not going to use Grammarly. Um, and, and I think that, that that centering that mode, the pure game theory this works like this. When people shoot for perfection and the highest thing, they often not only don't get that, they do way worse than if they had just shot for the thing that they could get. Look at the chat, Emily. I will not be perfect. Look at all these imperfect people. It's all over my TikTok too. It's great. No, oh, they're doing it on TikTok too. All the TikTok. I will not be perfect. Yeah, I have you up next to the microphone. So you're sort of like zooming in, but yeah. Yeah, so the biggest thing, right, is someone just had a really funny intentional typo that I won't say out loud, but... Um, the biggest thing is just that, like, I'm seeing a lot of your questions in the chat and I'm intentionally not answering them because yeah. I'm not answering them because they're not that important. Right. So just keep that in mind that right now your test is in what the next 10 hours or something like that. You are not going to learn anything more about world history than you don't already know. And if you do, you're going to forget it tomorrow morning. You are not going to magically learn how to write a thesis statement if you don't already know. And that shouldn't make you feel bad. That should like free you, right? You have to, at this point, just trust. I know what I know. And like, literally this test is bonus. If you don't pass this test, literally nothing happens to you. I promise you, yeah. if you don't pass this test, only you and your teacher see it. You can literally hide your score from all the colleges you apply to, it doesn't matter. If you pass the test, it's awesome. And you should be really proud of yourself and you can get college credit and save some money. If you don't pass, literally nothing happens to you and it's fine. So think about this test tomorrow as like bonus points, extra credit. You've put in the work all year, do your best so that you can maybe try to like stick it to the college board and like get that college credit and then walk away and just like, Go watch the new Bridgerton spinoff and like, don't think about it for a while. So that's amazing advice. All our East Coast people, this is your dismissal. Go to bed. Unless you want to see the dog, he's coming out in a minute. We got to get to 300 likes to get the dog to come out. So press that like button. Um, he is sleeping. I have to, I have to wake him up and then lift him up with a forklift um, to get him on camera. Um, there is just a question that's come up 700 times and for the persistence of Ram Ram, I will answer it. There's this question of identify versus explain. And to Emily's point, you're overthinking this. Identify specifically means just name a thing. Um, once you've named it, you get the point. Explain means provide a couple of sentences. That's in short answer questions. Whatever you were hearing um, from Heimler, I'm sure was true about all of that. Um, so- too about yeah. that is just that a lot of people have been asking like how much do I need to identify or define something you never need to define something you can assume the person reading it knows so you don't need to be like one example is Woodrow Wilson's 14 points the 14 points were a series of points about a document you don't need to define anything you just need to explain it and kind of describe it enough that the grader knows you know what you're talking about, that they don't think you're just BSing and throwing out a term and hoping it works. So same with the identify. If it literally is just like identify one example of a totalitarian state or whatever, like you can literally just be like one example was and name the state, maybe give enough of a description just in case so that the grader knows you're not just BSing and then move on. Um, any other verb, describe, compare, explain, whatever, treat them all the same. Just answer, prove it, explain, move on with your life. I'm fighting a uh, this uh, this fly that's in the room with me right now. Is about to, it's, I don't know if you can hear it. It's the loudest sound in the world. Real quick, Emily, is um, there were some questions here and some things I want to show you all, especially our West Coast people. So, And by the way, I see all the likes and all the loves. I would love to see some more sheep in the chat right before I bring Marco on. Um, sheep emojis are the most accurate description of this dog. But one thing people were asking about, like, what, what does the contextualization look like? What does the rubric look like? Here it all is. Emily mm -hmm. actually writes a DBQ. So West Coast people, you've got time actually to watch this. Um, to Emily's point, though, you're not going to, like, transform your, your score overnight. Here's a quick walkthrough of the DBQ. Here's me grading Emily's DBQ point by point. So you want to dig into that, you can. There's also some uh, additional ones about individual points, complexity, strategy, different units, 
all here in this playlist, more than you need. The other thing that I'll point to that's super short and small to fit in for people where it's a little bit earlier is this, our study guide pack. This is free on our website. It's linked in the chat. Don't try to study uh, like nine units. Try to just grab one or two little things. If you need to study to deal with your anxiety, look at this. There's my dog with a pencil and glasses. Look at that for a while. That's some therapy. And then pick one or two things. So just DBQ skills, just one or two units, and that will help you. Another thing I want to show you real quick, everyone, is the college board's um, breakdown of the digital exam. If you have not broken the ice yet with the digital exam, you can um, experience what it's like. And I'm going to play this on 2x speed, um, just so I can just sort of walk you through. You see, on the, this is a lit exam. On the left is the passage where you can annotate. On the right is where you see all of those passages. You can mark um, you can even expand things out to adjust to your reading preferences, and that will help you. So there's a lot that you can do, everyone, on, on digital exams, including marking for review, going back and seeing them. I mentioned this earlier. You save your annotations. You can toggle back and forth. This video will explain to you exactly how this uh, works. So I'm going to say uh, digital AP exams video, um, and the study guides are um, in the pinned at the top of the chat and in the description, the digital AP exams video is available for you. The only thing left on our agenda, Emily, the only question in the chat that is relevant is where is your dog? Where's Marco? Where's the dog? I'll be back in one second. Yeah, I'm gonna, if you're on my TikTok, I highly encourage you to just go to the Marco Learning YouTube channel right now, but I'll, I'll do my best. I don't know if I can undo this weird effect I had. Ugh. I don't know. But let me let me see if I can. Uh, nope. Oh no. He ran away from me. There <laughs> he is. Huh? Oh, okay. Everyone's AP therapy. Oops. <laughs> you can take your pictures now, everyone. Oh, and it's not working. You got to go to the YouTube channel. Hi, Marco. Here he is. Oh. Hi, everyone. He looks calm, ready to take the test. He's already he chill. He's already studied everything he needs. He's trusting himself. He said to me, I will not be perfect. <laughs> he's definitely not. I think he's about to break my arm. So I'm just going to put him down real quick. Yeah, yeah. You're good. Oh, and let me um, see my doctor now. Um, listen, people, y'all are going to be fine. Give us some love in the chat. Actually, since we were doing, since I was impersonating Gen Z, um, let's just do um, another last one of the season for us, Emily. I will slay. I want to see it in the chat. A thousand I will slays. In Spanish, we did, <clears throat> we did, yo voy a eslear. Oh, Vamos wow. Eslear es de examen de Spanish. Eslay, which is definitely not a Spanish word, but we had a lot of fun with it. Everyone, um, Emily, any final words of advice as we slay this chat? and slay this exam. I'm trying to think of a Taylor Swift quote or something that would be really helpful, but it was like, what if I told you you're a mastermind and karma is gonna be your five on the exam tomorrow? I, it's a good reference. You don't understand it. I don't understand. You no. Know. I don't, I didn't, I, I've just learned. I mean, I've been learning so many Gen Z words this week. The AP psych chat was full of Riz. Um, we've had, um, apparently I'm real. And I'm so real for that and for real. I learned let let her cook. Let her cook. Because a lot of people were saying, who's letting her cook on the Heimler review? And I had to Google it and figure out that that was rude. So. Oh, and but you didn't, you, did you eat and leave no crumbs? Because no I. No one said I did. I heard oh. who's letting her cook and bring back Heimler. Yeah, bring back Heimler. That's it. <laughs> so everyone, <laughs> listen, um, it's great. Um, uh, I'm a mastermind. Oh, that's a good one too. Riz, nice. People, y'all are so real. Mr. Is it Thiessen? Um, and some other teachers shout out, by the way, just parentheses to all your wonderful teachers and to all of you for being brave and taking an AP test. So with that, we're going to end this video. Good luck, everyone. And be in touch with us on our YouTube, uh, Instagram and TikTok. Thanks everyone.